in the front, and here's this one on the side here, okay? So um, if you push on this, let's see if I can do this for you here, okay? You can see, I don't know if you can see that, but there's, there's kind of this weird screwing motion, right? So it, it seems it, is if I try and rotate this stage like this, if I try and rotate this stage like this, say I just push down on this, you, I don't know if you can see that, but it kind of, if I do that, it, it translates itself forward. So as I, as I rotate this like this, it translates it that way. Yeah, so if this doesn't come out. Okay, and then if I try and translate it that way, it forces the rotation. So when I push it forward to translate it, it forces a rotation like this. Okay, so you can see that. Let me see. The angle. So, right. So if I push it this way, it rotates that way. If I force a rotation this way, it translates that way. I can't decouple those. Okay, so there's like a screw is the degree of freedom. I, and and you, I, I wish, you know, come to my office and we can play, play with this. This is one of the most useful things to play with. Because as you play with this with your hands, you immediately feel, you know, it's very stiff in all directions, except it's very compliant about this uh, strange motion. And there's no way you can rotate it without translating. There's no way you can translate it without rotating, without breaking the system. So it's truly a couple thing. And when you do the first mode shape, okay, um, or when you do modal analysis, the lowest natural frequency by far is this motion. Okay? And so um, this, this brings up the review of Chassel's theorem, which says any motion of rigid bodies of space may be described as a screw motion. So, of course, you know, you know pitch is how much the body translates over how much it rotates. You know when the pitch is zero, it's a rotation. When it's infinity, it's a translation. And here is an example where when the pitch is, is not zero or infinity, some finite value, either negative or positive, um, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it translates in a coupled way. By the way, if it's, if it's positive, you use your right hand, point in the direction it's translating, it'll tell you how much it rotates. If it's a negative screw, you could use your left hand and point in the direction it's translating, it'll tell you it'll rotate in the opposite direction, okay? And, you know, a lot of people think, well, my goodness, you know, this is, this should be two degrees of freedom because it's a screw. It's, it's, it's rotating and translating. But no, it's coupled. You can't, it's very different if you have two degrees. Of so, so, for instance, if you go back to this and you took this beam out, right, then, then what you would have is, so say this beam was gone, then what you would have is, is four wires, Okay, so how many degrees of freedom would you have? Well, six minus four is two, so you'd expect two. And now you can indeed draw a red line that connects these because it intersects all these four. Okay, actually, let me, let me build this here. So let me, I'll take the angle bar out. Okay, and show you here. So, okay, so if you have this, you know, you have... Now, if you just have these four, you have two degrees of freedom, and the, the one red one's right here. And you can see, now you can just freely rotate this, and nothing is forcing it to translate. It's just a pure, independent rotation, okay? And then, and then, there's a, and, and, and then you can imagine, well, where's the other red line? We expect two, because there's two degrees of freedom. And so you've got, uh, you know, these two lie on a, a plane. Those two lie on a plane. Those two planes are parallel. So you would expect a hoop or a, you know, a red line pulled to infinity that's a circle with an infinite radius that all these guys are intersecting in infinity uh, whose perpendicular translational direction is this way. Okay, and you can see, let me face it to you here, see so you can see it translating toward you. You can see it translating away from you. And that's completely decoupled and independent from the rotation. So in this case, right, six minus four is two, there is two, there's the rotation and a translation and they can both independently do their thing with all the combinations, right? You can translate and you can rotate independently different magnitudes and get every combination. And there is infinite combinations, by the way. There's, um, with this, there's the pure rotation, the translation, and then, and then a pitch of every screw, or sorry, a screw with every pitch you can achieve by doing different linear combinations of the rotation and translation. Okay, so remember I said if there's ever two 
or more degrees of freedom, there's an infinite number of permissible motions. Well, the infinite permissible motions in this case is the rotation, the translation, and the screws of every pitch uh, from negative infinity to positive infinity, right? That's infinite degrees of freedom in there, or sorry, infinite <laughs> permissible motions with two degrees of freedom, okay? But when you add this other non-redundant constraint, it kills the translation and the rotation, so now the rule of complementary patterns doesn't work anymore. It's, uh, I mean, it's still a true principle, but it's incomplete. Okay, and Maxwell's still right. Six minus five here is still one, but um, that one is this screw degree of freedom. And since it's coupled, since you can't get different combination of the rotation and translation, since it's coupled through the pitch, it's considered one degree of freedom. Okay, okay, so now we get to the relationship between twists and wrenches. So this gets back into a little bit of math, okay? And this is really important to understand, um, and it's, it's actually pretty difficult to kind of wrap your mind around, and, and it's, it's basically the, the math of the entire fact chart and the entire theory can be summed up in this one equation, okay? And, but there's a different form of it that we're going to derive here that's particularly useful. Okay, okay, but, but this equation describes the relationship between wrenches and twists, okay? So, let's just take, so it, remember, a general wrench is, you know, you've got a coordinate system, you've got an R vector, it's the location of the vector that points anywhere along here, you've got an F vector that points along the direction, and you've got a Q, which is a coupled, um, right, torque to force kind of ratio, the scalar. Okay, and then here you have a twist, and that's the wrench vector, and then you've got a twist that has a C location vector that points to it, an omega vector that points along it, and then a pitch, which is translation per rotation, and I show it green. But remember, Q, if Q can be anything. If Q is zero, it's blue. If Q is infinite, it's black with a moment arrow about it. Uh, if P is zero, it's red. If P is infinite, it's a translation arrow. Okay? A black translation arrow. Okay, so the, the question is, if the wrench is a constraint, you know, um, uh, meaning, right, if, if, if there's some constraint that can provide some load to resist a motion, whether it be a pure force like wire flexures, that's the load they can impart on a body to resist a motion, or whether it's a moment or a, or a, rent, you know, or a uh, wrench, right? Um, the question is, uh, what's the relationship between that and twists that are degrees of freedom that are free to move? Okay, um, so if you have a system with a bunch of wrenches um, of, of any Q, uh, not just Q equals zero, of, of the blue lines like the, the constraints, what is the relationship um, with the degree of freedom or the permissible motion twists? Okay, up to this point, the relationship has been the rule of complementary patterns, but that rule only tells us what happens when the wrench is Q equals zero, which is blue, and, and it only tells you what happens when the P here is zero, which is red. And thank goodness because of hoops, that captures both rotations and translations. And of course the relationship is just this nice you know, qualitative, oh, all these lines have to intersect each other um, either in finite space or at infinity for them to be permissible motions. Um, right, so that, that's what we've been going off of this entire time to build freedom and constraint spaces. But, We've obviously found with the screw example an exception where the rule of complement patterns is no longer sufficient. I mean, it, it, it is definitely correct. It's always true, and we're going to mathematically prove that it's true, but it's a special condition when you only have blue lines and red lines and you're finding their relationship, okay? But yeah, what happens if you have wrenches uh, of any Q and twists of any P? Well, the relationship is this. This is the rule of complement patterns, the higher, more general theory of rule of complement patterns in math form in an elegant little equation, okay? Uh, and it basically says, okay, every wrench, uh, when dot producted um, with this matrix times every twist, where you recall that matrix with a delta in it is the matrix from lecture three that swaps the, uh, you know, angular and uh, linear components of velocity and the twist 
to be, so the linear is at the top and angular is the bottom instead of the other way around, um, equals zero. Okay, so it's the dot product of, basically it's the dot product, the dot product of the wrench with the, with the twist equals zero is essentially the bottom line, except we're just using this fancy little matrix to switch them, right? And you might ask yourself, well, okay, first of all, why are you switching them? And, and secondly, what in the world does that physically mean? Well, let's, let's write it out. So, so say you have a wrench vector. That, remember, that's, um, uh, it's, it's got a 3 by 1 um, force vector on top and then a 3 by 1 tau vector on the bottom. We have it oriented like this because it's dot product. And remember, when you dot product things, you line up corresponding components, multiply them, and add them. So this is essentially what we're doing. Here we've already multiplied. You know, twist by itself would be omega on top and V on bottom. But by multiplying that by delta, this, this matrix delta, um, you, you swap the, those. So instead of omega on top and V on bottom, it's V on top, omega on bottom. And if you arrange them like this, then you can see we'll multiply corresponding components and add them together. So this is another way to say this and set it equal to 0. Okay? So you'll see here, by doing this equation up on the very top, what we're doing is we're aligning the linear force with the linear velocity. We're timesing those together. And then we're adding it with the angular like load, which is basically a moment, um, times the angular velocity. Okay? And we're saying that equals 0. Well, first of all, tell me what is force times velocity or, or torque times angular velocity? Well, hopefully you know by now in your education that's power. Okay? Um, force times velocity is power. So, um, so basically what we're saying is all the, all the motions, all the twists that don't allow the constraints, wrenches, to produce any power or work. Of course, uh, power is the derivative of work with respect to time. So it's just work is, is um, you know, or power is, is the change in work over, t over the change in time. Um, so if, if the power is zero here, you can say, well, you know, another way to think about it is, you know, what are all the twist motions I can impart on something, T, so that um, it won't produce any work uh, with any of the constraints in the system. So you could imagine if you, if you take a stage, you know, two stages that are joining a wire and I yank the wire along its axis, it's going to take a lot of work to move it because that wire can resist that along its axis. That's, that's the model. There's a pure force uh, wrench vector, a blue ideal constraint you draw through the wire. And what that means is it can impart a resisting force along its axis. So it, it, a motion that stretches it will produce non-zero work. It will produce work. But if the wire can't impart any other force along any other direction, then when you take the body and move it perpendicular to the wire, then that, is, that corresponds with a twist or, or a displacement or a motion that doesn't allow the, the, that constraint to produce any work. And so that's why that's a permissible motion. Okay. So when you're trying to find the relationship between permissible, you know, permissible motions as modeled by twists um, in a scenario where you have a bunch of wrenches that, that are constraints that, okay, if the Q is zero, there, there are wires that you're familiar with, but maybe there are constraints that could do wrenches and, and moments. If you have it all in there, if you can find all the twists that when you dot product with them and make sure, oh, by the way, of course, you, you do this delta thing so that you can line up the linear with the angular, because remember, nature organizes twists and forces, you know, or loads in, in, within wrenches very differently. In, in, in wrenches, the linear components on top and the angular components on bottom. And in twists, the, the, it's the other way around. The, the angular components on top, the, the linear components on bottom. So if you, so you obviously have to, you can't just dot product them. You have to uh, flip, flip them so you align linear parts with linear parts, because it wouldn't make sense to times torque by v linear velocity or force by angular velocity. That's not power. So, so you, you, once you take care of doing your bookkeeping and s flip things to correct for nature's uh, weird way of packaging this, and then dot product them, set them equal to zero, then guess what? You're going to find for these wrenches all the twists that don't cause them to produce any work. And that is what a degree of freedom is. So, 
I hope you can kind of, with that, uh, you know, as I stammered through that, conceptually get a sense for uh, what this relationship means, what, what a degree of freedom even is in this definition, and, and what constraints are and, and what their relationship is. So, and, and again, a degree of freedom is something that when the system moves, the constraints in the system can't resist it. They can't produce any work. If they could resist it, then they will, and they will produce work, and that will be a constrained direction. Okay? Okay, so, so if we do this and we simplify it, it should, the rule of concrete pattern should slip out of this. And you'll see it does. Okay, but let, let's, let's go through and, and do this. So we got this far to the left side of this. If you write this out in Plucker coordinates, you know, twist land, you remember the, the t torque is R cross F plus QF. Write that there. And remember V is C cross W plus PW. This is just twist definition. Except again, I've, I've flipped this because I, I took the delta in there. So this is equal to zero. Now, if you know your vector math, uh, the way you dot product this, um, this all simplifies to this equation. And definitely put me on pause and convince yourself of that. You line up corresponding commas, multiply and add, and know how to work vectors. Um, you'll, you'll simplify it to this expression. So this is essentially the same as the top. And then I want to you know, add some things to this to show the shortest distance line is D. That's the distance between these two planes. The skew angle, you know, of if I take this orange line and move it up here, the skew angle is theta. And note here, I'm going to, it's a little cluttered, so I keep going back and forth. If I take C vector minus R vector, that's this vector here. And if I take omega cross F, and see, do the right hand rule, it will be a vector that points down perpendicular to these planes, and is, is this, okay? And phi, by the way, is going to be the angle between C minus R and omega cross F, okay? So I just kind of randomly wrote those there, and we're going to use those to simplify this further. Okay, so remember the dot product of this is the magnitude of this times the magnitude of that times the cosine of the angle between them, and I just said the angle between them here is phi, so, cosine, so hopefully you see how that is that. Okay, and then, you know, p plus q is p plus q, but times magnitude of this times magnitude of omega times cosine the angle between those. Angle between those is the skew angle, because there's omega and there's f. Okay, so hopefully you saw that simplification. Okay, and then what you need to know, this is key, c minus r, the magnitude of c minus r, which is this magnitude, the length of that, times cosine phi is going to be negative this distance, the shortest distance d. So, you, you know, the whole reason I drew all that is so you can see the diagram that this is the case, okay? That's the shortest distance. So we'll plug that in there, okay? And now we get, um, okay, we have to find the magnitude of this, which is magnitude of o omega times magnitude of f times uh, sine of the angle between them, which is theta. And we've plugged in this stuff, which is negative d, okay? And then this stuff stays the same. So hopefully you've gotten to this point. Now you can see this stuff will cancel, and the whole, this whole equation simplifies to this. It basically says P plus Q equals D times tangent theta, where D is the shortest distance between the wrench and the twist, and theta is the skew angle. Okay, and Q and P are, are what Q and P are, right? So this equation is essentially that. This, this, this equation right here at the top is how you can kind of intuit the relationship, I know the physical meaning of degrees of freedom are motions that don't allow the constraints to do any work. Basically the constraints can't resist them um, and therefore they allow permissible motion. Um, that, that's kind of how you intuit it and, and derive it, but then if you simplify it, out comes this magic equation that's not at all intuitive, but it's, it's mathematically equivalent to that. And this is the one you'd want to memorize. This, is, this basically can generate the entire uh, fact chart, even, even stuff I haven't shown you yet. Um, this is the whole grand equation of the entire course. So you definitely want to memorize this, okay? So to prove that this is the mathematical expression for um, everything, including it, it encompasses the rule of compromise patterns, let's, let's uh, simplify this to, to something that would apply to the rule of compromise patterns and, and to flexor synthesis. So of course, when we're designing parallel flexure systems with wires and blades and all these flexure elements, we're really only, at least at this point, just using blue pure force wrench vectors constraint lines. So 
let's make this blue and call Q zero. If we call Q zero, this, this equation simplifies even further to P equals D tan theta. Okay? So basically, if you have a system that's made of wires or blades or wh whatever, just um, a bunch of blue constraint lines, pure force constraint lines, and you want to find what twists are the permissible motions that are, are permitted, uh, then you want to find some twist that, that makes this equation true. In other words, you want to find a twist where it's d, its shortest distance from all of the blue lines, and the theta of all the blue lines equal the same coherent pitch. And if you can find that, then that twist will exist with that pitch. Okay, and it will be viable. Okay, so let me show you a little bit more what I mean here. Okay, so, so again, say we just have this one constraint, and say we have a twist, and it's some distance d, and it's some theta this, and it's some pitch that. Well, if this is going to be a degree of freedom of this constraint line, say you have a system, two rigid bodies connecting the two blue lines, you know, the blue lines, just a single wire flexure, this, this will be a screw that works if, you know, for any pitch constrained by this distance d and theta. Okay, but now, now check this out. Say we make the theta zero. So, so now if the, if the skew angle is zero, but it's still spaced by distance d, then guess what? Theta is zero here, d is non-zero, and what is tangent zero? Well, it's zero, right? So some finite d times zero is going to be zero, which means, yes, a twist can be satisfied when the skew angle is zero, in other words, when it's parallel, when the pitch is zero, which is what? A rotation. So we just proved that if any red lines are parallel to blue lines, they will satisfy this equation. That's, you know, we knew that from rule of concrete patterns because those both intersect at infinity and that's, that satisfied the rule. But, you know, we just proved mathematically that if red line, you know, if, if a twist is parallel to the blue line, then it will work as long as its pitch is zero, it's a rotation. Okay? Well, okay, so now what if, what if we go back here and we allow the theta to be not zero, so it's, it's no longer pointing in the same direction, but d becomes zero. Okay, so, so now it's actually intersecting it. So you see the, the skew angle, which is not so skew anymore, is still the same angle, but it, d is zero now. So now you put d zero. Tangent can be anything here, okay? Um, you know, something uh, that's, non, that's not 90 degrees, and it's not zero. It's just, just intersecting at some non 90 degree or non zero angle. Then this will, this will be finite, and times zero, this will be zero. So what we just proved is that if you have a twist that intersects a blue line, uh, it will work as long as the pitch is zero. Which is the other thing. We just proved blue lines rule of counter independence. We just said red lines always intersect or are parallel to have them work with every blue line. And this just showed that that's the case. If a twist is going to work with the blue line, um, it better, if it's going to intersect or be parallel, the pitch better be zero. Okay, so we just proved that that is true, um, but, but again, it's not complete. It doesn't tell the whole story. First of all, it, it didn't tell how we found screws. This is how you find screws, okay? This is how you find red lines, and, and by virtue of red lines, because you have red hoops, you can find translations this way, but um, there's other ways to find translations, okay? Now let's look at, um, you know, speaking of translations, what if the skew angle is 90 degrees, but the distance is finite? Well, so now we have a finite distance times tangent 90 degrees. Tangent 90 degrees is infinity. Infinity times finite is infinity. And so that means the pitch has to be infinite. And that means this has to be a translation for it to work. So basically, it tells you any twist that is perpendicular to a blue line will work only if it's um, uh, you know, if, if it's, will we'll work if its pitch is infinite, which means if it's a translation. And we know that uh, translations always work if they're, per you know, if you have a wire, it can freely translate in any perpendicular direction. Uh, you already know that. And, and you can, of course, prove that from Blinding's Rule of Concrete Patterns. You take the um, red lines and pull them to infinity. They'll make a hoop in, in directions that are perpendicular, uh, you know, to, uh, 
to the, the blue axis, right? But, uh, but this proves it in this way. Okay, now look at this interesting condition where it intersects, the twist intersects, so D is zero, it's on the same plane, but the skew angle is also 90. So now this is really weird, because this, what this means is this is zero times tan 90, which is infinite, so zero times infinite is what? Well, remember, I taught you zero times infinity can be any real number, it can be anything. It could be infinity, okay? Um, so a translation, and, and again, before, it's kind of silly to show, once it's a translation, it doesn't have a location. Like the D kind of is meaningless. It's just the direction is what matters. And so, so here, of course, let's hope translations still work. So let's hope P, zero times infinity can be, you know, infinity as well. Of course, they can be any, any real number, okay? So zero times infinity can be infinity. So, so it, 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 translation still works. It's perpendicular to it. So thank heavens for that. Um, but m even more interesting is that um, the P can be zero as well, because zero is, is something. <laughs> it can be anything, right? So, so it can be a rotation, um, and it can also be uh, uh, any pitch. So it could be a screw with any pitch. So remember, zero times infinity can be anything. Infinity, zero, or anything. Negative, positive. And so that means if you have a line, if you have a twist that, whose line of action intersects a blue line, it will satisfy this condition regardless of whether it's a red rotation, which thank goodness, because that's what Blanding, or you know, the rule of company patterns says, it doesn't care if it's intersecting at 90 degrees or, or at a different angle, it just satisfies it for red. But it also sat satisfies it for any green of any pitch, um, if it's 90 degrees, and it also satisfies it for a translation, which we already proved, but that's great. Okay, so, all right, so let's look at uh, an example here. But now what you're probably still confused about is like that's just how to satisfy for one blue line. Let's follow the equation P equals D tan theta. But that equation has to hold for all the blue lines that you're going to pursue here. Okay, so let's look at our good old screw example and see if we could have found or calculate what the pitch of this is. You know, you could intuitively play with it. You knew it screwed. You knew it certainly wasn't a rotation or a translation. Um, it didn't follow the rule of comparative patterns, so you need to use this higher rule that's more general to make to, to, to find the degree of freedom, and, and so Maxwell can be correct that uh, six minus five does indeed equal one degree of freedom here. Okay, so so here we go. So let's draw this blue line, and let's see if this blue line satisfies this screw. Well, first of all, the the skew angle is is 90 degrees, and its distance is zero because it's intersecting. So once again, that pitch could be anything. So yes, I mean, first of all, that could be a rotation translation or a rotation, and it would satisfy that one, okay? Okay, or a screw of any pitch. Same thing with two. That makes the nine, same thing, zero times tan 90, zero times infinity, it could be anything. Same thing with that, same thing with that, okay? Because they're all, they're all intersecting it, which means D is zero, and they're all 90 degrees, which means they're skew angle, but not so skew anymore. Um, is, uh, is, is 90 degrees, so tangent 90 is infinite. Infinity times zero is something finite. So, so, and remember, if that was it, if we had just gotten rid of this angled beam and we just had those four, then we just proved what I told you before is that a rotation works, a translation works, and a screw of every pitch works. In fact, infinite screws of all pitches will work. That's what we just proved with this. And, and there would be two, there would be infinite permissible motions as there always is if there's two or more degrees of freedom and there's two degrees of freedom, rotation and translation. Or, you know, the rotation and translation are just the furthest apart in pitch land, but um, as long as you have two independent permissible motions, there are the degrees of freedom. So you could have picked two, two screws with two different pitches and they'd, they'd be considered the two degrees of freedom as well, right? So it's not like it has to be the rotation and translation. It's just those are the simplest for your mind to see. Okay. okay, but now we, we add this fifth constraint, and it's no longer two degrees of freedom. It kills the translation, the rotation, and all the other screws of pitches, and it's going to hone in on one screw with one pitch. So it can be six minus five is one. That's what Maxwell says it should be. So what is that pitch? Well, it's obviously not determined by these four because they're all intersecting and perpendicular. It's determined solely by this guy, okay? And what you do is, you know, the other question is how do you define, you know, D could be positive or negative, theta could be positive or negative. So, so how, do you, how do you define what's positive and negative? Well, if you have a blue line, 
Okay, you can, you can go from the blue line with your right hand, always use your right hand, and go to, imagine, 